Harvest Workers Together. It was um, about four years ago. I was in uh, Jakarta, and then I went to Bandung, and then to Manado. Anybody know where that is? What country am I talking about? Indonesia, that's right. And there in Indonesia, I met a, an Indian man. Uh, he was actually from Singapore, and we were speaking at a conference together. His name is Paul Raj, and I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but we were eating a meal together, and Paul Raj began to share the testimony of a family member, actually his father, and the testimony was so powerful, I said, stop, stop, I need to get my laptop so I could record this story, because it was just so amazing. I said, can we have breakfast together tomorrow morning? He said, absolutely. So I brought my laptop and set it up to record, and I'm so glad I did, because the story he shared with me impacted not only my life, but thousands of other lives around the world. You see, his father, Paul Raj's father, was a government school teacher in the south of India. I have the name of the little village. It was called Kaniseri Pudur. No idea. But it's in the south of India. He was a government school teacher. And um, to make a little more money, well, he was an animistic Catholic and Hindu all kind of scrambled together. But to make a little more money, besides being a government school teacher, he did mesmerism, hypnotism, uh, palm reading, and communicating with the dead to help supplement his family income. So Paul Raj, uh, who I met there uh, when we were in Indonesia, he, he grew up in a family where strange things happened. His father had the ability to control the movement of people. So uh, he would see a young lady walking down the road and, and he would, in his mind, tell her to turn left and, and she would just turn and walk in another direction. On one occasion, someone who was sick came to their home. Paul Raj remembered his father. The pain was in the person's head. He, he grabbed the pain and dragged it down through the person's body and threw it out of the building and the pain was gone. Now, the Bible says not all those supernatural things come from God, right? Do not believe every spirit, the Bible says. And many will even claim to have done things in, in his name. And, and, and the Lord says, I never knew you. But, but I saw these things happening in his home. How could God reach a person like that? This week at Newbold College, we've been talking about cultural awareness. And that's not just so that we can love and respect each other, but so that we can um, connect with other people to tell them about the love of Jesus. In fact, where's my key? You, that, that, that sensitivity to the culture of another person, to where he or she is coming from, if we have that, it is indeed a key that will unlock a door by the Spirit's blessing to, to reach that person uh, for Jesus. But how is God going to reach uh, Masalamani? That's his father's name. Government school teacher practicing all kinds of what we call sorcery. And the answer is through someone named Jaya Silan. I've never met him, but I admire him greatly. Jaya Silan was a lay evangelist there in the south of India. And they were planning some evangelistic meetings about 20 kilometers away from the village where Masalamani and his family lived. But how do you reach someone like that with the good news about Jesus? What do you think? What should he do? Should he just go and say, you're living in darkness and I came to bring you the light? Do you think that would work? Maybe in some situations, if the Spirit is leading you. I'm sure that J.S. Elan prayed as he went to visit homes in the village that day. And it was now evening time. And Masalamani was home from his teaching position at school. And there was a knock at the door. Masalamani opened the door. A stranger standing there, later to discover his name will be J.S. Elan. 
And uh, Jesse Lan looks at this teacher and he says, may I have a cup of water? Well, in that culture, I don't know if it's the same in your culture, when someone asks for a drink of water, it would be rude not to care for them, wouldn't it? And certainly in their culture, that was the case. And so Masalaman, even though he didn't know the man, went and got a cup of water, and J.S. Ila drank it, said thank you, and left. You say, Derek, that, that's not a very powerful witness. <laughs> you asked for a cup of water and drink it, and said thank you. But the next evening, there was a knock at the door again of Masalamani's house. Would you like to guess who it was? J.S. Elan. I came to say thank you for the cup of water and to ask if I could pray a blessing for your family. Mm. Masalamani certainly believed in prayer, though they were kind of recited prayers, you know, you pray them over and over again, and maybe he didn't understand that prayer was like the opening of the heart to God as to a friend, the kind of prayers that change families, maybe he didn't understand the power of praying in the name of Jesus, but, but he certainly believed theoretically in prayer, and so he allowed uh, J.S. Silan to pray a blessing for the family, and J.S. Elan prayed, and he prayed in the name of Jesus, said amen, and then he left. He said, well, I suppose that's a little bit of a witness, but not very much. Next evening, same time. You know who it was, don't you? Yeah, it was J.S. Elan. Came back again, and he said... Um, <clears throat> Um, I, I would like to, to read a Bible text to you and, and pray for your family. Well, he established a little bit of connection by coming for the last two evenings, just for a little while. So he read a Bible text. I don't know which one it was. I suppose I could ask Paul Rush. He might know. That's the son. He read a Bible text, and then he prayed, and then he left. And that could be the end of the story. But he come back the next day, in the evening, and he said, um, I'd like to explain the Bible text that I read to you yesterday. And pray for you. And by the way, we're having some meetings in a town about 20 kilometers away, and I'd like to invite you to come. And he said, yes. And so after a busy day of teaching at the government school, every day he would go 20 kilometers to the meeting in another town. And there, as he read the Bible, maybe for the first time, certainly studied it for the first time, he learned so many things that he had not known before. In fact, many things that challenged the traditions and the, even the practices in his family and, and he came to a crisis in his life. I don't know if this has happened to you, where what God's telling you to do and what you're doing are not the same. It can happen. You read something and you're not doing that. And, and he was challenged. In fact, he was wrestling with that one day as he was walking to school. And God met him on the road. Now, try to put yourself in God's shoes, if you can. How might God reach this man? I mean, he's certainly seen a lot of supernatural things happening. By the way, he believes his power came from the Virgin Mary and from the village saint, Xavier. That's where he got his powers to do all of these things. But he's really living in darkness, out of harmony with the Word of God, so how would you imagine that God might meet him? What do you think God might do? Well, Paul Rice told me what happened. He's walking along the road, and all of a sudden, a whirlwind appears coming towards him. You know what a whirlwind is? And it's coming straight towards him, and then it stops. 
Now, there was a place in the Bible where there was a whirlwind, but God wasn't in the whirlwind. Do you remember that story? And then there was the fire. God wasn't in the fire. And God was where? Do you remember? In the still small voice? That was with Elijah the prophet. But, but this time, God is actually in the whirlwind. And God comes. The whirlwind stops right in front of him. Would you like to know what the Lord said to him? I wrote it down. First word. Somebody guess. First word the Lord says to this government school teacher, mesmerist, hypnotist, palm reader, communicator with the dead, so-called dead. We know those are evil spirits. What do you think the first word is the Lord says to him? You're right. Did you know the story? Good guess. His name. You see, the Lord knows your name. Somebody ought to say amen. That's really good news, Graham. God knows your name. He knows your name too. Yes, he does. He knows us. God is not trying to hide from us. He's trying to help us to find him. First word. Masalamoni. That gets your attention, wouldn't it? A voice out of a whirlwind. Masalamani. I am with you. Good news? Good news? That's really good news, isn't it? Even though he's struggling with all these things and whether he should let go of things or not. Masalamani, I am with you. I call you. You are on the right track. Amen. Well, that was something that Masalamani really needed to hear. And he left that experience. And he said, I'm going to follow all of the truths of God's word that I'm learning. And he, at the end of those meetings, made a decision to be baptized in the name of Jesus. Amen? And when I heard that story, I thought... That's an amazing lesson for us because somehow God gave this lay evangelist, J.S. Eland, wisdom to know how to unlock the door to Masalamani's heart. The reason it's important because, is because Jesus, before he ascended to heaven, he gave this instruction to us. Would you read it with me? I see it on the screen here from Acts 1, verse Eight, and choir, you can see it on the back wall if you have good eyes, right? Let's read it together. You shall be witnesses to me, where? In Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So if we were talking here uh, at Newbold College or Newbold Church, uh, we might say you will be witnesses to me in Binfield, right? And in? Bracknell and Berkshire or the UK and all over the world. And if you think that's just talking to the 12 disciples, look at what Jesus says in Matthew 28 right before he ascends to heaven. Let's read this together. Let's read it. Go, therefore, and make disciples of what? All nations. And lo, I am with you always, even till when? That can't, can't just be the 12, right? Because it's all the way to the end. So that would mean it would include us. He wants us to go and share the good news about a God who loves us with an everlasting, immeasurable, unfailing love. A God who's not trying to hide from us, but wants us to find him. And if we've learned anything this week about cultural awareness... Certainly that we can love and respect each other with our uniqueness, but also that cultural awareness is vital preparation for mission. And the reason that's important is because of something Jesus says in the scripture that was read today. And that is that the harvest truly is what? Now, I wish I had time to unpack all of that, but I just met with Mark Finley not too many weeks ago, he was in Tanzania. Anybody from Tanzania? Nobody here. Tanzania. Okay? East Central Africa. He was there in Tanzania. 
at the end of May, beginning of June. That's not that long ago, right? Just a few months ago. And Hope Channel Tanzania, which is one of the 53 affiliates of Hope Channel International that I have the privilege of serving, broadcast those meetings to 4,500 locations across Tanzania. He's preaching on the shores of Lake Victoria in Mwanza, and it's broadcast to 4,500 locations. Would you like to guess how many people were baptized in Lake Victoria at the end of those meetings? Did you read the report? 2,000 people were baptized. Is that amazing? That's almost as many as the day of Pentecost, right? But did I tell you that those meetings were also broadcast to 4,500 locations? Would you like to guess so far how many have been baptized as a result of those meetings? 36,000 people. I mean, you're dead if you can't say amen to that. Those are people heading for hell, whatever it looks like. And I think whether we, whatever we think about it, we don't want to go there, right? That have been rescued from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. 36,000 people were baptized, including a mosque where an imam who had to become friends with the Adventist community allowed them to put up a dish and 60 Muslims were baptized as a result of those meetings. They did get a phone call. I'm impressed to share this. I didn't share this first service, but they got a phone call from a convent Four nuns had been watching all of the programs on Hope Channel, and they called and asked if they could be baptized. What do you think? Can we baptize nuns? Huh? What do you think? Every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, God has his people in every, every place. I had the privilege of being in Kenya in February. I'm not a great evangelist, but I believe we can all do something for Jesus. Do you believe that? One of the people baptized at those meetings was a Maasai warrior. He was twice my size. Now, it's not hard to be taller than me. Here's a big man right here. But he was at least as tall as you. A Maasai warrior. And he had a big borehole in his ear. I mean a big one. You could like look through it and see what it was like on the other side. And Jesus called him. He committed his life to Jesus and was baptized. Amen? Every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. But how do we reach these people? What's the key to understanding who they are? You see, there's a challenge with this great harvest, and that is that the laborers are few. People are so busy today. I, I ask myself the question, why are there so few harvest workers? I mean, if the harvest really is great, why are there so few? Let me ask you another question. How many are called to be harvest workers? How many? Is it just like a few of us or all of us? We're all called to be harvest workers. So, so now I have a question for you. The problem is not that there are too few harvest workers. The problem is there's too few working harvest workers. Are you with me? There's two. <laughs> so why aren't, why, why aren't the harvest workers working? I'm not here to offend anyone, by the way. I'm speaking to myself. Jesus told a story about a man with two sons in Matthew chapter 21. He came to his first son, probably his oldest. That would be the way they would do it in that culture. And he says, son, go, go and work today in my vineyard. He could have said, the harvest is great, son, and, and go work. And what does the son say? What does it say in the text? I will not. Uh, but if you read on there in verse 29, afterwards he, he regretted it and he went. Why? Because he was acting foolish. Their harvest was great. It was not an unreasonable thing to ask him to do. And then the father came to his second son. Said, son, go work in my harvest. And, and what does the second son say? I will. I go, sir. 
But what? He didn't go. Count on me. Sign up. But then he didn't go. So I have a question for you. If the harvest is great and the laboring laborers are few, why didn't he go? What do you think? You think he was lying? You think he was just lying? Said, I'll go when he had no intention of going? You think so? Anybody think he was lying? Just lying to his father. Unlikely. Because his older brother had just embarrassed himself by saying, I won't go. And then he said, I really need to go. He's not lying. I believe he had every intention of going. But he became, what's the word? He became distracted. So what distracted him? Well, we don't know, but Jesus told another story. Maybe some things, and then I'm going to share what distracts me. And maybe some of you will resonate with one of those, or maybe the thing that distracts me, even though the harvest is great. Jesus told a story about a supper. They weren't even called to work. They were just called to come. But they all began to make excuses, the Bible says in Luke 14. What's the first excuse? Someone says, I, I'm sorry, I can't come. Why? I just did what? I just acquired a material possession. He's not planning to do anything with it right now. Just look at it. It could have said, I just bought a, a new BMW. Or I just bought a new, uh, you name it, suit of clothes, just went to look at it. And the material possessions have distracted him. Another person says, uh, I just bought five yoke of oxen. Now, most of us here, we don't work in agriculture, but, but that would be like, I just bought a new tractor. That's not just a material possession. That, that's work. He says, I want to go and test them. In other words, I need, I need to see how well they work. His work is distracting him from coming. And then a third person makes an excuse, and he says, I just got married. I know. What's that got to do with anything, right? Okay, just got married. Invited to a banquet. You know, just got married. It's like, why can't we go to the banquet? It's a weak excuse. And yet, as we think about our own experience, at least as I think about mine, is it possible that material possessions could distract even us? Is that possible? You know, I grew up here, and now I live over there. Pray for us. This is not easy over there. I still have my British passport, by the way, just in case it gets really bad over there. But there's a... You say it already is. Um, but there's a problem where I live. I don't know if it's here. But people where I live are addicted to material possessions. I don't know if you know, that, but, but they keep building bigger houses, and, and we have garages, you know. Some houses have four garages. But, you know, but you know what? If you have two garages, and you can't get in them because they're full of stuff. Does that happen here too? No? The, they have another thing uh, where, where I now live. They have these little, little garages in town that you can, you can rent them to put stuff in. Do they have those here too? No? You know, you pay so much a month because we have too much stuff. And we all know that we cannot take anything with us. So like we're mad. We keep accumulating more stuff. And, and then, you know, when you get old, then your children have to get rid of all of your stuff. I wish I could tell you it was only outside the church that we can be distracted by material possessions. We can be distracted by work, too. That's one that I've struggled with at times. Even doing good things, you can be distracted. 
and relationships. Is there anyone here honest enough to say, at one time I was involved in a relationship that was distracting me from being the person God wanted me to be? Is there anyone here besides me? No, just me. Oh. Oh, thank you. I have a witness on row seven. Thank you. Bless you, sister. I hope you found freedom from that distraction. Not just wife, husband, but relationships can distract us. And we could end right now, and I know you would like to have lunch and head on. But if we stopped here, we'd be really kind of discouraged because there are people like Masalamani just waiting to hear the gospel. Some of them may live right next door to us or maybe at the place where we go to university or go where we work. They're right there. And they are just waiting to hear good news from someone who really believes in God. And we get distracted too often. I do. Here's the one that isn't in the story, but it's the one I struggle with. I don't know if there's anyone that's like me. But I'm just, uh, just telling you honestly, sometimes I get afraid. I get afraid to be all that God's calling me to be. What, why might we get afraid? I mean, if the harvest really is great, there are people just waiting, why might I be afraid? What, what, what could cause that fear? Anybody? What could cause that fear? Lack of faith. Pray for me. That's possible. Lack of faith. Faith, there was a gift from God. Hallelujah. Don't have to save myself, right? By grace, through faith. And that, not of myself, it is a gift of God. So I'm going to ask for that faith. But still, sometimes fear will hold me back. What else? Could, what, what might I be afraid of? Anybody? Oh, who said that? Thank you. Sometimes I'm, we're afraid, and I'll say we, because I don't think it's just me. Sometimes we're afraid, maybe Yes, Elon could have been afraid and said, I'm going to go to this mesmerist, hypnotist, palm reader, and he's going to tell me, you're stupid, get lost, right? Possible? They, they might reject me. That's one thing that I think we can be afraid of. Thank you. What else might, what else might we be afraid of besides rejection? People are just waiting to hear. What else might I be afraid of besides that they'll reject me? Failure, yeah, that somehow I won't do it right, you know? I don't know whether when J.S. Elon knocked on the door and he opened the door, he was planning to tell him, lift up the trumpet and loud let it ring, Jesus is coming again. And when he opened his mouth, he said, can I have a cup of water? <laughs> I mean, doesn't Jesus say, don't be afraid when you stand for the council, for in that very hour it will be given to you what you must say. And it is not you who speaks, but the Spirit of my Father who speaks through you. I mean, I don't know. I'd like to meet J.S. Elon someday and ask him, is that really what you intended to say? If the answer is yes, I'd say, praise God, you're, you're a wise man. You found a key to unlock the door just asking for a, a cup of water. By the way, there's someone else that did that, I think. Isn't there a story in the Bible about someone who asked for a drink of water? John chapter 4. But fear of failure, that maybe I just won't be able to do it right. And that's why Jesus goes on and tells us what we have to do. Because there's all kinds of things that distract us. And yet there's people just waiting. Your friends, maybe. Just waiting. You're afraid, oh... They might reject me, or I don't know if I'll do it right, telling them about a God who loves them. So Jesus says, because of that, harvest is great and the laborers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. The, the word pray there in the Greek is, uh, is not a, just regular, like to make a request or express a desire. It, it's a very strong word. It means to beg. We won't look at all of the text, but I'll put a few up there. This is where a leper comes and he begs Jesus, if you're willing. Uh, the next one in, in Luke 8 is a demoniac. He's been set free from a legion of demons. Remember the pigs? Legion of demons. And he begs Jesus that he could go with him. It's a very strong verb. 
Luke 9, a, a, a father whose son is controlled by a demon, and the disciples try to cast the demon out, and they can't. And the father comes to Jesus, and it says he begs him, if you can, help my son. It's a very strong, strong word. How we're supposed to pray, because the harvest is great, and there's too, too few harvest workers distracted by all kinds of things. And then Luke 22, where Jesus says to Simon Peter, Simon, Satan has sought to, do you know the text? Satan has sought to what? Help me someone. Satan has sought to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you. Detomai is the verb. I've cried out to God for you. I've cried out to my Father on your behalf. Jesus says. So here's my question. And I, I, I pray I can live this every day. But I do have a question. You know, I mean, why do I need to cry out? Why do I need to pray like I've never prayed before? Am, it, am I trying to change God's heart by crying out to Him? Brother says, no. Whose heart needs to change? What's holding me back? Lord, whatever it is, I cry out to you. Whatever's holding me back from being the woman of God you've called me to be, the man of God you've called me to be, whatever it is, I'm crying out to you. So when God intervenes in your life in a supernatural way, as he did in the life of this Wonderful lay evangelist, yes, Elan. And the enemy comes and says, how dare you use that person so powerfully to tear down the kingdom of darkness? The Lord will say, my child cried out to me. Amen? My child gave me permission to work through her in world-changing ways. No more little prayers. Help me to have a nice day. Help me not to go get so angry with my spouse today. When God wants to use us to change the world. God, whatever you need to do, I cry out to you. And I cry out to you, oh, this text is so poorly translated. There's only one translation that is really accurate. Anybody here from Australia? Any Australians here? No? Okay. No Australians? There's one uh, Australian linguist who translates this text accurately. You see, you see it says there to send out laborers. That's not what it says in the Bible. Apostello means to send out. We get an English word. What English word? Apostello. We get the English word apostle. That's right. It means one who's sent out. But that's not what's found in this text. Found in verse 1 and verse 3, if you're interested, but not in verse 2. In this text, the, the verb is ekbalo. Cry out to God to ekbalo laborers. And, well, balo means what? Balo means to throw. And we must have some Greek scholars here. The prefix ek means out. So, if balo means to throw and ek means out, ekbalo would mean to? It's not that complicated, is it? So why didn't they tell us that in the text? Why did they say, pray to God to send out laborers, instead of cry out to God to throw out laborers? You say, well, I don't know. It sounds dangerous. I mean, where is he going to throw us? How far will he throw you? All the way to Newbold College or all the way across the world, or maybe right next door. How far will he throw you? This verb, ekbalo, is used more than 30 times to cast out demons. You say, Derek, I don't know if I want to pray for God to throw out. That sounds violent. It's in John 2 where Jesus cleanses the temple, and it says he drove out the money changer. You want me to pray for God to be that intense? And the answer is yes. It's time. It's time. It's time to stop praying silly prayers. 
time to say, God, whatever you need to do, because I get distracted by all kinds of things. And for me, I think fear is the big one. But then I found this text in Mark 1, verse 12. I'd read it before when I was younger, but never understood the language. It sounded weird. I'd always read about the temptations that Jesus uh, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, and after 40 days he, he was hungry. You remember that? That's in Matthew 4. But in Mark 1, verse 12, the language was strange. At least I thought it was. Because in Mark 1, verse 12, it says, And the Spirit drove him out. Strange language, isn't it? Would you like to guess what verb that is? Ekbalo. The Spirit threw him out into a ministry that would change the world. And, and, and we know the Holy Spirit never forces anyone. So, so if the Holy Spirit threw Jesus out into his ministry, that means that Jesus gave him permission. He said, Father, harvest is great. Lots of distracted laborers. I beg you to throw out laborers and you have my permission to begin with me. No wonder he would say to the 12 and to the 70 and also to us here today at Newbold College at the church here. And I'm, I'm, I'm listening to the sermon and say, just cry out to God and say, God, throw me. See, here's, here's what's important. Notice what's on the screen. Jesus knows. What does he know? What does he know? He knows where you'll be most effective in his harvest work. He knows. In fact, he has been preparing you all of your life. Did you know that? He's been preparing you, sir, all of your life to do an amazing work for him. Master Lamani, he, did, he didn't know that. Before Master Lamani ever came to faith in Jesus, God had already been preparing him to do a great work. You see, our God is an awesome God. He knows the end from the beginning. Do you remember what Master Lamani's occupation was? Anybody remember? What was his work? School teacher, right? Government school teacher. So do you think after he gave his heart to Jesus because God met him there on the road, having studied the scriptures, come to conviction, do you think, do you think he lost all of that talent to teach just became, because he became a follower of Jesus? Do you think he lost? You know the answer to that, right? He didn't lose it, did he? In fact, he went home and he shared with his wife and seven children and they all became followers of Jesus. And that's not the end. Oh, by the way, he was persecuted in the village. I don't know if this has happened to you. You decide to follow Jesus, and even sometimes your friends will persecute you. Do you know that? Is it true? People you used to be friends with, they're like, why did you do that? They took rocks and they threw them at his house and broke the tile on his, on his roof. And his children were expelled from the Catholic school there in the village. Had to go several villages away to a Hindu school that would welcome them. Persecution. But Masalamani had made his decision. God had revealed truth to him. And he would be faithful that his whole life. In fact, after one year, there were 50 followers of Jesus in his village. He donated a piece of land. They built a little church. A light shining there in the darkness. Three of his sons, including Paul Raj, who I met. Three of his sons became pastors. One in what we call the 1040 window in the Middle East, one in a very difficult region, another one in the south of India where his family was from, and, and then Paul Raj, he works in Singapore. Do you know there are tens of thousands of Indian workers in Singapore? They build the ships there, and God has given 
Paul Raj a special burden for those people. You see, he understands them. He, he has the key because he's, he understands them. He, he, he realizes that they're all precious to God. When I had breakfast with Paul Raj and recorded the story, he said, uh, my father fell asleep in Jesus just a few years ago, but he was faithful all of his life. And 33 family members are now full-time workers in the cause of God. 33. And Paul Raj has two children, Ben and Betty. And they're both preparing to be full-time missionaries in the cause of God. Who could have imagined? Who could have imagined? Could I, have a, could I have a cup of water? That God would use that simple encounter to impact a whole village and then to spread and impact lives around the world. I just want to be available for God to use me. Do you? Huh? Or, or should we just try to collect as much stuff as we can until we die? Or it may be just as bad to say, well, I've accepted Jesus, so I'm saved, and I'm just going to sit on my hands and try to stay out of trouble until Jesus comes, and the rest of the people can... We cannot do that. We have to say, God, I'm available, whether I'm 18 or 22, whether I sing like angels or sing like me. God is going to use our talent and he's going to throw us to the place where we will be most effective in his work. Stop trying to engineer your life and start saying, God, I'm available to you. In fact, I cry out to you and I give you permission to do whatever you need to do. And when you see miracles happen, my sister, you give him all of the glory because he alone is worthy.